Um, I have to do some a little self-promotion for Veterans for Peace. Um, we have two, two events coming up. One is on Veterans Day, which is November 11th. This is the, uh, the Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And we marched behind the uh, American Legion parade. And we're 300 yards behind them. So we have our peace parade behind their parade. And, and then we, we, uh, we follow down and we, we end up at Faneuil Hall where we have a, uh, a program for peace. And this year the vets will be from different eras from the Second World War to the current wars will be reading poetry from, and, and, and song from, uh, that they have written. They have, so it's gonna be very powerful. Uh, also this year, the, uh, we've always had the peace groups with us. So uh, United for Justice and Peace and Mass Peace Action will be having a standout at 12 o'clock at Park Street Station uh, on what is going on in, in Syria and Iraq right now. And then at, at 1 o'clock, they will come over to Beacon and Charles and will join our parade and all the way down the Faneuil Hall. So, um, how, many, uh, how many veterans in, in, the, in the room? Just raise your hand. Great. Uh, Ann and Will. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm the coordinator for Veterans for Peace for the greater Boston area. And uh, all my songs have a little story, but I'm gonna make this brief. Uh, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union and the National uh, 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 Labor's, um, National Lawyers. Lawyers Guild had petitioned the Boston police to let them know how much surveillance they were doing of the peace groups. And they were ignored. And then they asked that uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, they wanted to find out what was the extent of the surveillance of peace groups, and that was ignored. And then they filed a federal lawsuit, and they ended up getting all this stuff. And I went, and I spent over two hours at the ACLU's office going through all these films of all the Occupy and, and peace demonstrations and whatever, and then there was a lot of written documents and whatever. And in the written documents it said, um, Veterans for Peace, an extremist organization, blah, 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 blah. And I said, wait a minute. We know who the extremist organization is. And, uh, you know, people like Carlos and Melita, you know, people like Ann, people like Will, you know, we're known as extremists. Guess what? We're all known as extremists, everybody in this room. And so, so I went, uh, went home, and, uh, and, and which is very, typical of me, you know, throw me in jail, you're going to get a song. And I went home because I was significantly pissed off and at that designation. And so I wrote a song, Extremist. So this is, this is the song, Extremist. And uh, it's, it's dedicated to all of you. I, I, that was, I, was I wasn't clapping for myself, I was just quiet third graders <clears throat> oh there you go oh there you go there you go so um, if you want to sing along with it it's an easy song it says it goes they call us all extremists cause we're out here in the street how unpatriotic veterans for peace they say we got to watch them like never before cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war well, they call us all extremists, cause we're out here in the street. How unpatriotic, veterans for peace. They say we gotta watch them like never before, cause they're Nothing more dangerous than veterans against war. Well, they stand on every corner with their cameras in their hand, taking film and snapping pictures of everything they can, upload photos, write reports on everything they saw, protecting all our citizens from folks who broke no law. And they call us all extremist calls right here in the street. How unpatriotic, veterans for peace, they say we gotta watch them like never before Cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war 
Well, they've been watching us so long, they know us to our core. They know we're peaceful veterans who know the cost of war because we've seen the horrors and the price we always pay. They've got to document everything we do and say. And they call us all extremists cause we're out here in the street. How unpatriotic, veterans for peace. They say we got to watch them like never before cause there's nothing more dangerous than Veterans against war. Well, wars are rackets, Medley said 80 years ago. 30 years of fighting, he once ran the show. A two star major general who had something to say. When we go to war, a few profit, many pay. And they call us all extremist calls, we're out here in the street. How unpatriotic, veterans for peace. They say we gotta watch them like never before Cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war Well, they can listen anytime to anything we say Eyes and ears are everywhere thanks to the NSA Read our emails and our tweets, monitor our calls Fourth Amendment, just be damned Cause they're above the law And they call us all extremists Cause we're out here in the street how unpatriotic, veterans for peace, they say we gotta watch them like never before, cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war. Well, they got Homeland Security, FBI, and DIA, state and local police, don't forget the CIA, why we are so important, a clear danger to the land. Can't let this love and peace thing get too far out of hand. And they call us all extremist calls, we're out here in the street. How unpatriotic, veterans for peace. They say we gotta watch them like never before. Cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war. Well, they got their brick, play all their tricks, and wasting all our dough. All those files and photos with nothing much to show. So we raise our voices here today to let them know it's time. Stop hassling the peace groups. Go back to fighting crime. And they call us all extremist calls. We're out here in the street. How unpatriotic. Veterans for peace. They say we got to watch them like never before. Cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war. Cause there's nothing more dangerous than veterans against war. <laughs> Thank you. Almost forgot I had to make a couple announcements. That's why Val's looking at me funny. Uh, just two quick announcements. Um, the first one is that in the workshops, we have some students who are acting as recorders, taking notes. But we're short two recorders for the afternoon workshop because someone was sick. So if there are any of the students here to today who were interested in being a recorder, but I said no to you because all the places were taken, well, all the places aren't taken, so I could use two more recorders. So please make yourself known uh, on either now or on the break. The second is um, the Mideast workshop. It, w w when we break this session, we're going to hold it in this room uh, because the, uh, you could just tell it's going to be too crowded in the room we had scheduled it in. So we won't go to room 56114. That, that Mideast workshop will be here. Okay? So with that, uh, um, I'm going to introduce Val Magadam, Director of International Affairs at Northeastern University. <laughs> Thanks very much, Cole. Thank you, everyone. Um, and that was a terrific song that we started with. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. I'm Val Magadam um, from Northeastern University. And um, a shout out to my students who are here as well. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, I'm just delighted to be able to, um, to moderate, uh, to chair and moderate this session. Uh, two of my uh, favorite um, 
scholars and advocates and activists are here. So welcome to uh, the plenary on US foreign policy problems and solutions. Let me start by um, introducing our two panelists, our two guest speakers today. Phyllis Bennis, you've heard her already. Um, I'm sorry, not, not yet. yet. No, not yet. <laughs> this is the first time you will hear her well, again at the Middle East, East well, Workshop. Well, well, exactly. um, Phyllis <laughs> is a fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies. She helped to co-found the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation, as well as United <laughs> for Peace and Justice. Her work is grounded in human rights, international law, and equality, and she works on opposing wars and occupations. She engages with broad US foreign policy issues regarding war, the UN, and the Middle East. Her books include Before and After US Foreign Policy and the War on Terror, and a set of, that's this book, everyone, and it's um, available for sale outside and then a set of primers, which um, I just purchased, um, including um, this one, um, Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli uh, Conflict, um, and others that deal with Afghanistan, um, the Iraq War, and the US-Iran um, crisis. I first met um, Phyllis uh, when I was a graduate student in, um, uh, in Washington, D.C. at American University in the late 70s, early 80s. So I'm aging myself. And me. Um, Thanks a lot. And no, OK, 80s. We were children. OK, then. 80s. All right, yeah, we were like 16. Uh, um, very premature. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, she's, uh, she's just been so impressive all these years, and um, I last saw her in uh, Paris at UNESCO when I was working there um, some years back, and it's just wonderful to see her again. Um, our next speaker is um, probably known to many of you in this um, room, uh, Stephen Kinzer is a well-known um, author, journalist, and academic currently at Brown University, a former newspaper reporter. Uh, the veteran New York Times correspondent has filed stories from more than 50 countries on five continents, as well as having published a number of books. <clears throat> During the 1980s, Stephen Kinzer um, covered revolutions and social upheaval in Central America, as well as published his first book, Bitter Fruit, about military coups and destabilization in Guatemala during the 1950s. In 1990, the New York Times promoted him to bureau chief of its Berlin Bureau, from which he covered the growth of Eastern and Central Europe as they emerged from Soviet rule, the so-called transition to um, capitalist democracy, I guess. Kinzer was the New York Times chief in the um, newly established bureau in Istanbul from 1996 to the year 2000. Um, I should also mention that he is the author of a very celebrated book. I mean, a number of his books are very well known, but uh, probably my favorite and the favorite of most Iranian-born <laughs> um, people is All the Shah's Men, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror which came out in 2003. And upon returning to the United States, Stephen Kinzer became the newspaper's um, culture correspondent based in Chicago, um, and he was also teaching at Northeastern University. So, um, and as I mentioned, currently he's at Brown. So um, each, uh, we'll start with Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Bennis, um, uh, followed by Stephen Kinzer. Each speaker will speak for 15 to 20 minutes, which should give us about half an hour for um, your questions and comments. So without further ado, Phyllis. Thanks, Val. It's great to be here. It's great to see all of you giving up an incredibly gorgeous Saturday afternoon for serious discussion about what do we do? You know, what, what's the strategy? Where do we go? after this very grim uh, election that showed us a lot of what lies ahead in terms of what we need to do, how much work there is ahead of us. You know, the US, when it comes to foreign policy, has a big problem. I mean, it has a lot of problems, but it has one very big problem. It has remained an empire sort of past the expiration date <laughs> when people in the, the rest of the world thought that empires were OK. Um, you know, it's sort of like Israel. It was sort of, it came to colonialism too late 
to be okay as a colonial power because by that time, anti-colonialism was the word of the day and it's, as a result, it's quite unpopular. And as the U.S. stabilizes in this position of what looks more and more like permanent war, the unpopularity of that kind of drive towards empire creates a lot of problems. Now, a lot of that, as we know, is rooted in the question of U.S. exceptionalism. This idea that it's not just that we can be militaristic, it's not just that we can try and be the, the police of the world, but that that's all a good thing. Why is it good? Because we're special. We're the shining city on the hill. We're different. And that whole notion sort of pervades everything we do. And it was perhaps the most overt in a certain way around the response to the, the terror attacks of September 11, where you had a horrific terror attack no question about that. And it was an enormous crime, a crime against humanity on a pretty big scale, killing somewhere around 27, 2800 people in one fell swoop. That's like not small potatoes. That's a very big, huge global crime. But the decision to answer that with a global war was something that no other country could envision or that certainly the US would never permit any other country to say that it was now going to fight a war everywhere it chose, including perhaps in the United States, because it says, whether it was Britain or China or whoever, we're different, we're better, we're more important, and therefore, we can take the world to war and make the world pay the price for this terrorist act because we say so. So this is a huge, huge problem, and it comes back, you know, are any of you classics scholars, classics ex experts? good, because I always get this wrong, and somebody always comes up to me afterwards and says, no, no, that's not really the right translation, like I did my own translation from ancient Greece, right? But there's, there's the Melian dialogues, uh, you know, in, in ancient Greek history, where you had, it was basically a, a military scenario. You have the, the ancient Athenians, and they had their, their little democracy. They were creating democracy for the first time in the Western world, at least. We won't talk about African democracy and Native American democracy. But in Europe, the Greeks had democracy kind of, it was a slam dunk for them. And they decided that they needed strategic reach. They needed more land. So they went to the island of Milos. And they said to the Melians, we're taking your island. And the Melians said, we don't think so. And the Athenians said, well, sorry, but we're bigger and stronger than you are. So your island is ours. Get out of the way. And the Melians said, well, what about this democracy stuff that you guys keep touting around the world? And the answer was, for us, there is democracy. For you, there is the law of empire, yeah. or the law of the powerful. This is very much the operative definition of international law as the US practices it. There was an incredible piece. I cut this out of the Times a, a couple of days ago. There was this article about a fairly grim situation, as the overall situation is very grim, in Syria. This particular article was about a, uh, a scenario where, where um, Al Nusra Front Islamist extremists had overrun several uh, towns and villages that had been controlled by local uh, Syrian opposition fighters and, and they had been forced to flee and a lot of people had been killed. So what's the headline in the, sorry, not the New York Times, in the Washington Post? Major setback for US in Syria. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, are, who from the US was there? You know, it was a huge setback for people, Syrian people, not American people. But the framework, and we see it in the press, we see it in the government, is it's all about us. It's all about our rights. So this new war, whether we want to call it the Iraq War III, we could call it the Global War on Terror 2.0, we could call it the ISIS crisis. I, I was using that for a while, then I thought it's a little too cute especially now because it's not only about ISIS, it's about others as well. But so whatever we call it, work. this is really the extension, a continuation, it's the latest iteration of a long-standing war, which is for resources, for power, for military bases, for control of access to resources for others. It's very much the same war, but in a slightly different context, in a global context in which there are some limits on the nature of empire. Some of them are economic. The U.S.